welcome everyone. Uh, good to see you here. There's plenty of room if you want to uh, come down uh, closer. Um, what, what I want to do with uh, my colleague Lori McKenzie today is talk about how we might advance women's leadership. And um, I thought what I would do to get us started on that is give you a sense of where we are in terms of women's leadership in the United States today. So the slide here, um, when you take a quick glance at it, what you will notice uh, is that women are underrepresented and continue to be underrepresented at the top uh, levels of all sectors of our society. So the first two bullet points show us the dearth of women in the corporate sector. If we drop down to the third bullet point, we see that women make up only 18% of our Congress. And this was after a year which supposedly just was a watershed of women entering Congress. We're still at only 18% women. University presidencies of our top research universities, only 17% of women. And as low as these numbers are, if we were to drill down and look at women of color, they're considerably lower. Now, this is actually really quite surprising in one way, and that is it's been over 30 years now since women started outnumbering men and they're earning a bachelor's degrees. So any of you who are here from the class of 1980 or 1985, um, you, were, you, know, you were in college about the time when that tipping point happened. And if you graduated in, say, uh, 1990, um, you were at a period of time uh, here on the farm when people were very very optimistic about what was going to happen um, with women's leadership. Matter of fact, if you read books at the time about gender equality, the last chapter says, now with women flooding into college and getting bachelor's degrees, it's only a matter of time. But here we are, 30 years later, with these numbers. And when I think about why this is a problem, and maybe that seems obvious to people who come to a talk on women's leadership, but I want to point out that in addition to this being a problem for women, there's a societal cost to this. We have to ask ourselves what important questions and problems aren't being solved by our companies, our governments, and our universities if women's voices aren't being full, more fully included. Or to flip that around and be positive about it, think about what we could be doing in our governments, in our universities, and in our companies if we were more fully drawing on all the talent that women bring to our society. So that's what I want to talk about with you today. Um, clearly these numbers are low for all kinds of reasons. I teach a class, one of the Freshman Thinking Matters class on this topic, and we spend the entire quarter talking about all these reasons and how to get beyond this. Today I want to highlight just one barrier to you that I think is really important, and that is I want to draw out the way that stereotypes about gender and work lead to a bias um, in, how, in terms of how women are um, evaluated in the workplace. And so what I'm going to do is spend some time describing that problem to you and showing you that it's more consequential than perhaps we might think. And then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lori McKenzie, who's going to talk about some of the tools that we've been developing to move beyond that bias um, and to create workplaces that more fully embrace the talent of women in them. So I want to just start off with a research study um, that you may have heard of um, that got a lot of attention when it came out and really illustrates the kind of things that I want to share with you today. Um, and as this picture shows here, the context of this study is orchestras and the hiring of musicians into orchestras. So in the 70s and 80s in the United States, women made up only 5% of all orchestra musicians. So this was a really male type space. So we do a lot of work at the Clayman Institute in tech. And I think about this, and this, this was more male type than tech is today, okay? Um, and so, uh, the orchestras, major orchestras around the country, became concerned that perhaps one of the reasons there were so few women is that there was a bias against women in the audition process. And I think about that, you know, in the 70s and 80s, somebody making that suggestion, I'm sure there were lots of people that thought that that seemed ridiculous and doubted that that was kind of the right answer. But to these orchestras' credit, what they did, rather than just debating whether or not this was the case, they decided to do an experiment and find out. And we're always trying to urge the companies we work with, do an experiment, let's see. So what they did is they introduced a screen between the musician um, auditioning and the panel of judges, okay? So that the panel of judges could no longer tell if the musician was a male or female. Now, to make it a really good experiment, they found out they also needed to put carpet down on the floors because heel clicks were giving it away. So they wanted to make it a really nice experiment. You couldn't tell uh, who this person was. And what they found was rather dramatic. That is, the introduction of the screen increased the odds that a woman would make it past this first round of auditions by a full 50%. So it made a really big difference, okay? Um, if you fast forward to today, women make up 25% of orchestra musicians in our top or orchestras, 40% overall, still not at parity in orchestras, but this screen really did make a difference. 
I, I leave off with this example because it illustrates the two things I want to talk about with you today. One is that stereotypes about gender affect how women are evaluated. Without this screen, women were not being seen as competently as they actually were. And secondly, the screen. There are going to be tools that we can develop that are going to allow us to block the negative effects of stereotypes on how women are evaluated. Now, we're not going to be talking about screens later today. We're going to have to be more creative than that, right? But since most of us couldn't live our work lives behind a screen and wouldn't want to, but we do have some tools, I think, that can help us get beyond um, bias. So that's where we want to get to today. So I'm going to end up with this as my conclusion, OK? And, and then we'll, we'll work on getting there. I want to first show you how stereotypes limit women's um, leadership. Okay? But all the way through, I want to draw out one more thread. And it's not only that these stereotypes are limiting women's leadership, they're actually interfering with the goal of having meritocratic workplaces. Uh, meritocratic workplaces that are essential to innovation and discovery. What I mean by that is this. If we want to be as innovative as we can be, and if we want to discover the best uh, scientific findings we can find on our universities and in our companies, it's essential that the best ideas and the best talents rise to the top. And if that's not happening, then we're interfering with the goal of meritocracy in addition to limiting women's leadership. So let's talk a little bit about how this works. My job is to sort of review some of the social science and share some really cool studies with you. Um, but before doing that, I want to talk a little bit about the, the word bias itself. Um, bias is a word that often people don't like, right? It has kind of this ugly connotation to it, as if you're calling someone sexist or racist or something. But that's not how I'm going to be using the term here today. When I talk about bias, it's simply going to be an error in decision making. Okay, so if we think about the orchestras again, I think we can safely assume that most, if not all, of those judges wanted to hire the best musician possible, right? They didn't get out of bed in the morning to discriminate against women. That wasn't their goal. They wanted to hire the best musician possible. But for reasons I'm going to explain, once they saw the gender of the musician, that affected how they saw that person's abilities and skills, okay? What we're going to see here today is all of us are prone to these sorts of biases. They're unconscious biases, if you will, okay? which is the bad news. But the good news is going to be that there are procedures in place that we can put in place that keep us from acting on these biases. So I always describe this as kind of a no blame, high responsibility message. So that's bias. How, what does that tell us about how stereotypes work? So the key idea about stereotypes that we want to talk about today is that stereotypes function as what we might think of as a cognitive shortcut in information processing. So let me just talk about the orchestra one last time. Imagine that orchestra is auditioning like 100 musicians for just two or three openings. And that would not be uncommon at a major orchestra. If you're one of those judges, that's a lot of information to take in, right? 100 different people performing. You're having to keep all that information straight. In those information-heavy information contexts, we understandably look for shortcuts to help us process all that information. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, we really, none of us today in our jobs, as busy as we are, could get anything done at work if we didn't have some sort of shortcuts that we took in processing that information. But unfortunately, stereotypes about gender and other categories of people function as one of those uh, shortcuts. And when they do, they're going to create some, I think, undesirable outcomes. So how does this work? This slide here summarizes 30 years worth of work on, the, on stereotypes. So if I'm going through it quickly, um, you know, 30 years. Um, so what the research shows us um, about stereotypes is that we instantly, within milliseconds, sex categorize any person we interact with. That is, we take notice of whether we think that person is male or female. And we do it in just milliseconds, OK? Cannot help doing it. In the United States, we do this with race as well. So the things I'm going to talk about with gender work for race as well in the United States. States. In other countries, they have different things that they may instantly categorize people on, but in all known societies, sex is one of those. Why is that important? Well, once you put someone in a category, or put anything in a category, you unconsciously or implicitly expect that, that person to be something like that category. So research shows here, um, with data from over 30 countries, that what happens when we categorize someone as a man is we're more quick to associate him with leadership. All the words that have to do with leadership, we can make these quick, unconscious, mental associations with leadership. Whereas with women, instead, we make slower associations with leadership, but quicker associations with things like being a, being a supporter, a follower, a contributor, but not a leader. What this means is that for men, we tend to expect men to act more like leaders. 
psychologists call this agentic, to act active and you know, capable of getting things done and decisive in the way that leaders act. Where we expect women to be warm and communal, nice, concerned about others, the kind of things we might expect of someone who is being supportive. And we certainly don't expect women to be dominant and assertive. Okay? We might expect men to be, again, un at an unconscious level, better at male-type tasks like technology, and women better at female-type tasks. These stereotypic um, expectations that occur out of awareness are important because they frame or shape how we judge people's performances, such the very same performance looks slightly different to us if it had been offered by a man versus a woman. And we saw that in the case of the orchestras. The bottom bar, the problem with this then, when we're thinking about the world of work and how people might advance into leadership, is this then, these, these quick associations affect how we evaluate people in the workplace, whether when we're hiring people, thinking about promoting people, who to put on projects. It affects the kind of opportunities we give to people in the workplace, and it affects the amount of influence people have. When someone makes a suggestion, does it sound like a good idea, okay? Does it sound like something worth funding? Okay. I want to talk to you today about a couple of ways that, th that these stereotypes work and show you some examples, and then we'll turn to the important ending point that we want to get to today, how do we block these effects. Okay, so the first, the first way that stereotypes work is they shift the standard that we use to judge people. So it turns out our standards shift around a little bit depending on if we're evaluating a man versus a woman, or if we're evaluating, in the case of race, someone who's white versus a person of color. If you think about why this would be, I'll use gender as an example here, um, if a woman performs well, and especially if it was in a male-typed domain, this runs counter to those quick associations we have. So one thing that we tend to do is to more carefully scrutinize her performance. And we do this even if in a situation where we're in awe of her. So I've been talking a lot about um, Mary Barra, the CEO of, uh, of, of uh, General Motors, Stanford alum. Um, when General Motors announced the new CEO, and it was a woman, I don't know about you, but this ca caught me by surprise, right? I, it's, this is the you know, automobile industry. Who would have seen this coming? So I was kind of, you know, so I found myself reading and reading about, you know, why it is, how, how did she get to this point in her life? If General Motors had announced the new CEO was a man, I probably would have just like turned the page and read something else. It wouldn't have been news to me. But that extra scrutiny can, can under certain circumstances, open the door to bias. So let me give you a couple of examples of this. I want to start with an example that comes from the field of psychology. Um, and this is an experiment where what the authors of this study did is they created a resume for a person who had just gotten his or her PhD in psychology. So it had some publications on it, teaching experience, stuff like that. And they sent it out to psychology faculty all over the United States, and they said, evaluate this person, and importantly, tell us whether or not you think this person would be worthy of a tenure-track position in your department. The experiment was this. Half the people out there received the resume with a man's name on it, and the other half of the psychology faculty doing the rating received the very same resume except with a woman's name on it. So this is a really great way to see whether gender matters, right? The resume is the same. The only thing's different is the name. What they found was, again, rather striking. 79% of the people who got a resume with a man's name on it said he would be worthy of hire, compared to only 49% of people who got the same resume except with a woman's name on it. And in case you're wondering, it did not matter whether the person doing the rating was male or female. Okay? Male and female raters exhibited the same level of bias. We find this constantly in these studies. And sometimes this disappoints people. They want women to like, be better raters than, than men. Um, but the, the issue is these are stereotypes that we're all kind of commonly aware of, and they're affecting our judgments at an unconscious level. Now, in a second phase of the study, what they did is they had people evaluate these same resumes, except now these people are more experienced, okay? So now we're talking more about people you might move, want to move into leadership. So they have more grants, more publications, and the like. And what they found with these more advanced candidates is that people wrote four times more doubt-raising statements on the rating forms for women compared to men. So I would need to see evidence she had gotten these grants on her own, for example. Notice that extra scrutiny that's going on there or it would be impossible to make such a judgment without seeing teaching evaluations. Now, if you think about it, a teaching evaluation and wanting to see people's teaching evaluations before you hire them as a professor, that's a very legitimate thing, right? I would hope that we would want to see that. But the criteria is being enforced more rigidly for women than it is for men. 
Now I wanna just um, switch gears just slightly and show you another very similar study that was done in the context of race. We work a lot at the Clayman Institute for Gender Research on gender issues, but a lot of the things that we're talking about work similarly for race. So if we're trying to cre create more inclusive workplaces, a lot of the take home messages here will be the same. So this study was done in 2014, and what the authors of the study did is they created a legal memo that was ostensibly written by a third year a law associate named Thomas Meyer, who had gotten his law degree at NYU. And in the memo, what they did is they embedded it with certain numbers of errors. So there were some spelling errors, there were some factual errors, and there were some analytical errors. And then they sent it out to law partners and asked the law partner to rate the memo and give the person some feedback on how they were doing. Very, and so the experiment, very similar to the last one, the only difference was that half the people were told that Thomas Meyer was white and the other half were told that he was black. But the memo's the same. And what we find is this. There were three times more edits and comments written on the black Thomas Meyer's memo that compared to the white version. Okay, again, the same memo and they were twice as likely to find mistakes. So notice again that extra scrutiny that's going on for the person for whom people probably didn't expect they were gonna be as good to start with. They were doing what they were supposed to here, right? They were supposed to be finding the mistakes, but the person over here was getting kind of a leniency bias. And this is what we see a lot in these studies is this extra scrutiny of women and people of color with criteria that's very legitimate being applied more rigidly to them. This affected how people rated the memos, not surprisingly. The rating was considerably and significantly higher for white Thomas Meyer than for black Thomas Meyer. And it also affected their qualitative judgments. So the, the uh, white Thomas Meyer is generally a good writer, um, has potential. Black Thomas Meyer needs lots of work, can't believe he went to NYU. So these sort of drastic differences in how they're talking about this performance. So you can imagine how this would affect advancement into leadership going forward. One final example I want to give in this area comes from some work that, I, that I've done. Um, and, you know, when we think about how the, the experiences women have in the workplace, the experiences women have in the workplace are not just because they're a woman, because no one's just a woman, right? You're a woman, you're also, you have a race, you have a sexual orientation, you might have children, you might not, you might be disabled, and all these other things combine to affect the judgments um, that we make of people. So I've done some work um, um, looking at how being a mother might lead to disadvantages in the workplace. There's some um, literature out there on wage gaps that show that mothers experience a 5 to 7% wage penalty per child compared to childless women. Okay? And this is if you're carrying, comparing men and women, I mean childless women and, uh, and mothers who are in the same kind of jobs. So I was concerned whether this kind of biasing process might be affecting mothers as well. So what we did is an experiment where we had people evaluate either two women or two men one of whom was a parent and one of whom was childless. Um, so down in the resume of one of the two members of the pair, you learned that the person was an officer in an elementary parent-teacher association. Okay, that, so that's a subtle indicator that someone might be a parent. I mean, you don't have to be a parent to be an officer in an elementary school parent-teacher association, but I don't really think ever in the history of the PTA has there been an officer who was not a parent. So this very effectively conveyed parent status. Now, before starting the study, what we did is we pre-tested all of our materials to be sure we had two people who, when we didn't know their, their gender and we didn't know their parental status, were judged to be equally qualified. So just based on their resumes and performance evaluation. So there was no difference. Put names on the files, um, mark one as a parent, what happens? All of a sudden, the childless, uh, the, the mother is seen as significantly less hireable. So they, they said they would recommend 84% um, uh, said they would recommend the person who was childless compared to only 47% for the mother. Further, if they were going to hire the person, they were gonna pay her significantly and substantially less. Okay, so we see some evidence of a bias. For fathers, no such bias. Um, in fact, fathers, fathers are actually preferred compared to childless women, and if they're going to be hired, they're going to be paid uh, significantly um, more than childless men. So we see how parenthood's working differently for moms than for dads. We drilled down one more, um, to try to, one more layer to try to figure out what's going on here, and what we found is that people were stereotyping the mothers as being less competent at their jobs and less committed to them compared to the fathers who were seen as more competent and more committed to their jobs. 
Now, when I got these results, you know, I sort of suspected that I would get this difference in commitment because there's pretty strong stereotypes out there that mothers aren't as committed to their jobs. It's, it, it turns out that there's not a lot of data to support that, but there is these stereotypes. But the competence thing's kind of weird. Why would someone all of a sudden be like less, have less brain power after they had a child? Um, so I went to talk to one of my friends, Deborah Rohde, in the law school, and I was telling her about this, and she had just done some work where she was interviewing um, law associates coming back from maternity leave. And these law associates were complaining that when they came back from maternity leave, they weren't getting as interesting of work anymore. They were getting like paralegal level work and not the kind of work they had been getting before. And she told me that one of the people that she interviewed told her boss, I had a baby, not a lobotomy, to kind of drive home that point. So what we've seen here is that stereotypes can, sh can lead to this extra scrutiny, right? And we've seen it now for women. We saw it for African-American men. We've seen it for mothers. We might ask whether or not uh, why, whether or not women might be able to overcome doubts about their competence and get beyond the effects of stereotypes. I mean, what stereotypes are doing is causing us to see people as less competent than they are. Could we get past this barrier by asking women to self-promote? You know, toot your own horn, make sure people are listening to you. Could that help get beyond this barrier? Well. Lori Redman has done some interesting work in this regard. She's done a series of experiments where um, part people are evaluating people who are interviewing for a job. So if you were in this study, you'd be watching somebody who was interviewing for a job, and then you would give feedback to that person. Half the people are interviewing women, half the people, I mean, half the people are rating women, half the people are rating men, and half the people are rating people who are modest. So in the interview, they talk about what they've done, but maybe they give credit to their teammates, or I got lucky, or something like that. The other half are evaluating people who are self-promoting. So you can imagine this person, I drove sales, I did this, a lot of the language of I. So the question is, does this work? We often tell this to women, you know, you need to, you need to self-promote. If you don't toot your own horn, no one else will. I don't know if you've heard that saying. It's interesting, that's a very Western saying. Um, in, in, uh, in certain Eastern countries, there's the corollary statement that says the loudest duck gets shot, okay? <laughs> that means something different than, you know, toot your own horn. But in the, in the, at least in the United States and many Western countries, this is what we tell people, does it work? Well, it turns out for both men and women, yes. People who self-promoted, both men and women, were judged to be more competent than their more modest counterparts. So it raised people's sense of uh, perceived competence. That's a good thing. But for women, it also decreased their likability. So these more self-promoting women were seen as more competent, but people didn't like them, okay? What's going on there? Well, our stereotypes about women are that they should be modest, not dominant or assertive. So that this was a violation of a stereotype and was creating what scholars call this likability penalty. Men occur no such penalty, okay? They were the, the, the more self-promoting man was just as like as his more modest counterpart. Now, you might think, so what? You know, if I'm interviewing for a job, I want to be seen as competent. That's more important than likable, right? That, that is the trade-off. I would rather be competent than likable, right? Um, as my colleague Maggie Neal here in the Graduate School of Business likes to say, if you want to be liked, get a dog. You know, I mean, this is this is work. You know, but it does. It turns out it matters. Okay, um, for the man who was more self-promoting, he was more likely to be recommended for hire. People liked him, and they thought he was competent. That's a win-win. But for the woman who was more self-promoting, she was no more likely to be hired. People didn't want to hire her because they didn't like her, and they didn't want to hire her more modest counterpart because they didn't think she was very competent. Okay, so this is a bad trade-off, right? Um, this likability penalty is especially important for women as they move into leadership roles, because leadership roles are really about sort of enacting more um, agentic, self-promoting behavior to some extent, okay? So if we're trying to advance women's leadership, we've got to get past this likability penalty. I want to show you one more example of the way stereotypes work, and then we'll turn to solutions. And that is, stereotypes also can shift around the very criteria we use when making decisions about people. So I'll just show you uh, this particular study. Um, this study, the context is people are being um, considered to be hired as a police chief. So police chief uh, is a leadership position, you know, head of the police department. Um, it's also a kind of male-typed job. Um, and so what the authors of this study did is they created resumes for two candidates for police chief, okay? And they created them to be equivalently qualified, except one person had more education that was relevant to being a police chief, and the other person had more experience. So these are kind of two criteria you might care about, and one person's strong on one, and one's strong on the other. And that's often when we're making hiring and promotion decisions, that's how it is. Somebody seems better on this hand, but the other one's better on that hand. 
So in the first phase of the experiment, they have no names on the file. We don't know who's male or female or anything else about them except what they've done on the job. And what we find is that people overwhelmingly prefer the person on the left. And when they're asked to justify their choice, they say he has more education or this person has more education. So all this is telling us is that in this population, people are weighting the criteria of education more heavily than their weighting experience. Okay, so that's all we've learned. In the next wave of the experiment, what they do is they put names on the files. They get a different set of raters to rate the two applicants, okay? And now we have the man's name on the file that has more education and the woman's name on the file that has more experience. So what we would expect here is that people, you know, based on what we learned in the first condition of the experiment, we would expect that people would prefer the man because he has more education, and education seems to be the criteria that people were weighting more heavily. And that's what we find. Okay, so people preferred the man, and I asked to justify their choice. They said he has more education. What gets interesting is this third condition. Okay, now we grab a different set of raters. Okay, we give them the same two resumes. We just swap the names around. So now the woman's name is on the file with more education. And I've seen a couple people in the room laughing. They see where this is going, right? Um, so what we, if, we, if education is the criteria that carries the day, if it's where we're weighting things more heavily, we would expect that the woman would be chosen for the job. And all the people shaking their heads are betting no. Wouldn't make any sense if this was in my slideshow. If that was what happened. Um, and instead, what happens is they still prefer the man, and when they justify their choice, it's because he has more experience. So notice what's happened is the criteria has shifted from education um, to experience to justify probably what, what was people's gut hunch, this person was more right for the job. Okay, so we've seen a lot of depressing stuff here on reunion weekend back on a sunny day on the farm, right? We've seen how stereotypes shift our criteria around, our standards around, the likability, penalty, all this. Let's and on a positive note, by talking how we can get beyond these effects, okay? And what I want to suggest is that our solutions share one thing in common, and that is they have to break the tendency to use stereotypes as a shortcut. That's what got us into trouble to begin with. Good, well-intentioned people who are very busy trying to process all the information on their job in an implicit or unconscious way, stereotypes are affecting those judgments. So how can we get beyond that? We've been doing a lot of work at the Clayman Institute um, on a project that we colloquially like to call see bias, block bias. Um, working with companies in the Silicon Valley and beyond to first help people see bias in their workplace. Because these biases are unconscious or implicit, they're often hard to see. So what can we do to help people see bias? And then what kind of tools can we devise to block the use of that bias? Well, on the seeing bias front, one thing that really helps is teaching people about how stereotypes work. Once people understand how stereotypes work, they tend to be more careful and thoughtful in their own decision making. So this is a good first step. However, it's not going to take us all that far, and I think we all know why. That is, any kind of education or training that you've ever had, even if it was really impactful, right, it impacts you a lot today and maybe next week, in the week after, it's like a New Year's resolution, right? We're good in January, we're still okay in February, March comes, it's gone. Um, these things wear off, and I think about this on reunion weekend, every time you know, I'm you know, on campus, I think about, like, what if I could remember all the stuff I had learned at Stanford? I hadn't forgotten any of it, how smart I would seem. These things wear away. So we're gonna have to do something more than just educate people. We're gonna have to change the way we work. So what I want to end with, and then I'm going to turn it over to Lori, I want to talk just a little bit about what organizations can do to get beyond bias. And then Lori is going to talk about what we as individuals can do, okay? And that's how we'll end up today. So in terms of what organizations can do, there's really two broad buckets of things that we like to work on. Um, the first is that we can change the stereotypes about leadership, or more generally, change the stereotypes in our organization about what success is like. Um, so in the case of leadership, um, even though we know that leaders embody a diverse array of traits, people's stereotypes about leaders are very narrow. They're the Steve Jobs of the world. These, they are these, these you know, born geniuses that you know, drive change. Even if they have to step on people, it doesn't matter. We have sort of stereotypes about leadership, and that causes women to not see themselves as being as leader-like, and it causes people judging women's performances to not see them as being that, as leader-like. The, Amer the Association of Women in Science is an interesting example here. This is a group of uh, a women's groups that are across the 22 professional science societies in, um, in, in our country, so like the American Chemical Society, for example. And what they noticed is that women were winning very few career achievement awards, the awards that signal that you're just at the pinnacle of your career. Very few women were getting them, even though the pipeline of women was getting fuller and fuller. 
So what they did in some of the societies was an experiment where they changed the words they used in the call for nominations. And rather than describing the person as just being a genius and path-breaking, they said, please nominate people who've had considerable achievements in their career. And that makes sense because these were career achievement awards, right? But that language, changing that language, caused many more women to apply for the awards and for women to start winning the awards at a higher rate. So broadening stereotypes about leadership and success can be useful. Secondly, we need to change our evaluation processes when we're hiring and promoting people to block the effects of stereotypes. And I want to give you just a few quick examples here. One is that we need to develop clear criteria before people make evaluations. That police chief study I told you about, there was one final condition. And in this condition, what they said to the new set of raters is this. Before we show you any applicants, write down what really matters to you. And guess what? People wrote down education. And then when they saw women who had more education, they chose them for the job. There's about two decades worth of research now that shows the clearer the criteria, the more likely we are to hire and promote women and people of color. When you have clear criteria, you don't need the shortcuts that stereotypes provide. Secondly, we need to ensure that the criteria is evenly applied okay, to all people. So think back to the psychology study. I would need to see evidence of her teaching evaluations. If you're in a meeting and someone says something like that, what somebody in the room needs to be doing, and we call this person a criteria monitor, this person needs to be saying, if we're going to consider teaching evaluations, why don't we go back and apply that to everyone? Okay, that can be very helpful. Third, we need to increase accountability and transparency, okay? With accountability, people are asked to justify their choices, and when people have to justify who they're hiring or who they're promoting, they tend to make more thoughtful decisions. They, you know, if I'm going to have to explain to you why I preferred someone, I can't just say, hmm, it was a hunch, and I have to sort of think through what the criteria are and how the person mapped onto those. Transparency, posting numbers, keeping track of how you're doing um, in terms of hiring women and other diverse groups. And we do this at Stanford. Every year in the spring quarter, one of the vice provosts comes to the faculty senate and gives a report that we call gains and losses. And basically what we're doing here is we're looking at how have we done in gaining women faculty and gaining faculty of color relative to losing those groups of people. The goal is that we want our faculty to look more like our student body. And by being uh, transparent and collecting data on that, we keep ourselves focused on that goal and managing towards that goal. And then finally, Question, don't assume meritocracy. We work in a place, especially here in the Silicon Valley, where people tend to think that their organization is meritocratic. They're quantitative, data-oriented people, and they think they are meritocratic. But recent research has shown that organizations who think they are meritocratic are actually more prone to biases than organizations that know that they still have work to do. Okay? So if meritocracy is your goal, but if you treat it like a reality, it undermines the goal. And it makes sense when you think about it, right? If you think you already are meritocratic, there's no biases in your organization, you don't have a problem, you're probably not going to be con that conscious of trying to solve the problem. So questioning meritocracy and constantly asking um, and, and wanting evidence about how we're doing in terms of being fair and hiring and promotion is actually really quite important. Now, I know that not everyone here uh, is in running an organization where these points are that relevant. So what I want to do is turn it over to Lori, who is now going to talk a little bit with you about what individuals can do um, tomorrow to start driving us towards a, a, a world that is more meritocratic. I think you've seen from the research that we're in a society with these shared cultural beliefs. It's something we all share. So sometimes people say that's the point in the presentation where your kind of enthusiasm goes down. It's my job to bring you back up to that we can do something together. I'm going to actually ask you to see the unseen. And when I think about that, I think about these puzzles. How many of you can see the face of an old lady in this puzzle? Okay. And how many of you can see the face of a young lady in this puzzle? Oh, great. It's funny, when I do this with a lot of tech companies, the young face gets a lot of hands, and the old face doesn't get as many. So I think we have some age bias going on in Silicon Valley. So the interesting thing is it can actually take you some time to be able to see both these faces. At the one reunion weekend, this young boy had never seen it, and he got it in about a minute. And sometimes I find the older I get, the harder it is for me to see both sides of an equation. The good news is, though, that what we've learned is once your brain identifies both, it cannot unsee them again. 
So I hadn't seen this puzzle for about five years. And when it, they showed it to me again, I'm like, oh yeah, there's an old face and a young face. So our goal with all of our bias training is to ensure that we present you a way to see bias in a way you can't unsee it again. And then to have the tools to be able to block bias. We're gonna start with an experiment in language. So yes, you get to do this classes without quizzes. I'm not gonna quiz you, but we're gonna do some experiments together. We're gonna do an experiment in language because language is the most common way that we maintain and replicate cultures in our families, in our communities, and in our workplaces. I'm gonna have you do an experiment, so you, must, you should have gotten a piece of paper when you came in. You don't have to use it. I find also people, a lot of people like to use their devices, so um, there's a piece of paper. We have some pens as well. And all I want you to do is describe a top performer. So if you think of that in a workplace context, it might be a team you're on and there's one person you can always count on. It could be in your community. Where I live, there's this one family, they always host all the block parties. So I would count on her all the time to host these, that family to host the block parties. It could be in your family. So my job in my family is to plan all our vacations. And in that context, I would be called the top performer of my family's vacation planning. So whatever context you have, think of a top performer. And on that sheet of paper, just take a minute to describe in a few words the behaviors and attributes of that top performer. Doesn't have to be a complete sentence or a resume, just a few words to describe a top performer, whether it's at home, at work, or in your family. And thank you for passing out the pens. here? You thought this was classes without quizzes. So think of that person in particular, not a general top performer, and a few words to describe the behaviors and attributes of that top performer. Okay. Does everyone have at least one word down for their top performer? Great. Now, here's the thought experiment, and I'm gonna show you two descriptions, and they're written differently intentionally. So this is never gonna be how it would show up in life, but just come along with me on this journey of this thought experiment. Imagine that I've taken that top performer away, and I'm gonna show you the description of two different people, and I'm gonna have you pick the person to replace your top performer. So for example, in my family, if I no longer were planning our vacations, I'd say to my family, pick the person to plan the top vacation, right? So in the workplace, it could be on your team. Imagine that person got recruited or promoted out of your team and you're looking for a replacement. And I'm gonna ask you to pick description A or description B to replace your top performer, okay? And yes, they're written very differently. This is just an experiment. Now, how many would replace their top performer with description A? I would say it's 15%, 20%. How about with description B? Okay, maybe 75%, all right. Interesting, did you notice I've been priming you all the time by saying top performer, top performer, top performer? Notice how language has created an association of a type of person. And even when you're asked to pick a substitution for that person with just four words, we're able to do it, 80% of us pick description A. If I had said instead, imagine the person you count on the most to support you in your times of need. Even if that's the same person, you might have picked a different description. Notice how language is priming us to make associations, as Shelley said, and make decisions off just a few words. Now, why does this matter? Researchers at Rice University went through 400 letters of recommendation for the position of medical chief. Imagine medical chief is the person who's making life or death situations for a lot of people. And the researchers noticed that the more communal language that was used, which is description A, the less likely a candidate was to be put forward. So when I think of communal language, I think of it as the language of we, of community and of collaboration. The more agentic language that was used, so when I think of agentic language, I think of agency or the language of I, 
I am independently driving to an outcome. The more a, a communal language that was used, the less likely that candidate was to be put forward. Now thinking about us doing a presentation on women's leadership, guess what kind of person is more likely to be described with communal language? Women with the exact same qualifications. So the letter writers are the people who most want this person to be considered as the top candidate. And simply by using language that was more communal in nature, their advocacy was less effective. Why does this matter? So as Shelley said, we're using stereotypes as these cognitive shortcuts. Now, are there any native Russian speakers in the room? No, okay. So apparently in Russian, there's two words for the color blue. So if I showed you something that was blue and you're a native Russian speaker, your brain would take a slight longer bit to sort it because you're sorting, is that blue or is that light blue or dark blue? But in English, there's only one color. So if I show you something that's blue, you'll sort it more quickly. So the more binary something is, the faster our brain can make these decisions. The more shades of gray there are, the slower those cognitive processes are. Now part of what starts to happen is you assume in this binary world that the other doesn't exist. So if I assume that you're very communal, you're a very good team player, I might wonder, are you also willing to drive a decision home? And if you're more agentic, you're more driven, I might wonder, are you also able to be a great team player? Now here's the thing about leadership. When we're asked quickly to decide about someone's leadership, we're more likely to associate leader with agentic qualities. Even though we want a spectrum of qualities with leadership, when we're making those cognitive shortcuts, we're much more likely to rely on agentic terms in making those decisions. So you can see that the very use of language as an automatic function, seeing somebody who's equally qualified but foregrounding different qualifications has them show up differently when being evaluated for a leadership position. Here's the kind of list there is. That list is also on the back of your handout for you to use. Oftentimes, my friends will use this. So I just wrote um, a letter of recommendation for somebody to get into college and submitted it to the Common App. And I was very conscious of the kind of language that I was using in my letter of recommendation. Often people will go look at their LinkedIn profiles to see how they've described their own accomplishments. Or they might even look at their LinkedIn endorsements. How have you, in a quick you know, endorsement of someone, used language that might not have them seem as much of a leader? I have a friend who's um, um, a, pro a project manager, and she's really effective. And she said, everyone just says I'm friendly, and no one says I'm strategic. And I said, oh, she's also Asian. Asians are perceived to be very good at tasks. So when someone sees her, they see the task orientation she has, and they forget that she was very strategic in how she planned the events. So after she did the presentation, the next time she asked for a LinkedIn endorsement, she primed that person to talk about certain qualifications she had. So she would finally have a LinkedIn endorsement that didn't say she's really good at managing tasks. Um, I just want to give you an example. So at our institute, we're often given informal recommendations. So when we're hiring someone for a job, someone will send a note to someone to send to us so that they know that their person should be highly considered for a job. So I want to show you um, a little bit of that. I'm going to diagnose the language that was used. This is also a warning. Never send me a letter of recommendation if you don't want it to show up on screen. No, I'm just kidding. So this is for someone who worked on Capitol Hill. It was for us one of our most senior positions. It's for the position of marketing director. And this person went to one person to another person to really get me this because, as you see, this was high, high praise for this candidate. I'm going to dissect the language a little bit. Notice the words in black. These are her strongest endorsements of the candidate. Notice it's very vague. Scholar of what? Professional who? Led what accomplishment? So even this was high praise. I actually don't know much more about this candidate than I would from a letter that didn't say much about her. Another thing we know about women is they're more often described through their personalities than with their accomplishments. And when their accomplishments are described, they're often much more vague. 
and they don't have business outcomes attached to it. So this is another trend we know from our research. Notice that word actually. She and I actually worked together. Our research also shows that there are many more doubt-raising statements in women's performance evaluations. She managed to lead a good team, not she led a good team. In the end, she managed to deliver the project on time. Why do we need to say in the end? In the end implies there wasn't always going to be on track, right? So this kind of doubt-raising statement we also find is much more common in our evaluations of women. And lastly, look at the traits of this person. So this person, I later learned, was a highly rated scholar who had used her scholarship to advance an agenda that went to Congress. None of that was mentioned here. All I got was that she was passionate, committed, and determined. Now, I don't know about you, but as a woman, I'm often called tire tirelessly dedicated. I don't know if that's code for something, but when we look through the performance evaluations of women, they're also more commonly coded as tirelessly dedicated. And one of the things I always think is so funny is we're in this culture of genius, right? We want the next Steve Jobs, we want the next startup. In this culture of genius, it kind of is supposed to just come to you, and the rest of us are working tirelessly and dedicated, right? So, this research we did, as I talked about, was performance evaluations, which we redacted and took the gender out, and then we evaluated them for the way language was used. The reason we do this at the Claimant Institute is that we want to provide practical solutions for companies to then block bias in their processes. So if I broadly say to you, don't make vague praise, that's one thing, but if I said, here's exactly the way vague praise works in your company, you're more able to train people not to use praise in that way. So this was posted recently in the Wall Street Journal. It's part of a two-year research project we've been working on with some sites across the country to understand exactly how does bias play out. You can see some of the things we talked about. Women are given much less feedback. And when they are given feedback, it's not very specific. So I thought this was fake, but it's an actual citation. One woman was told to show it more at work. That was her feedback she got. I don't really know for why, what would the outcome be, and what would that provide for me to produce more results. The man, on the other hand, was told, combine technology A with technology B, and together that will help you launch this new platform. You can hear that that vagueness doesn't really help me much on my job. So women are getting less developmental feedback. They're getting a lot more criticism of their communication style. Do you remember Shelley talked about the likability penalty? The way the likability penalty will show up at work is you'll either be called not clear and concise at entry level, or off-putting at the senior level. So we notice the way communication shows up as a likability penalty in, in performance reviews. We're really excited that we're launching this new research in a three-part launch, and more excited that we'll be launching this research as part of a national summit in March 2017. Thanks to the generous support of GSB alum Bruce Golden and his wife, Michelle, Michelle Mercer, who was an undergrad and law degree, will be launching this as a national conversation to try to see and block bias in all of our workplaces. So this is the end of our presentation because we promised to allow some time for questions. So Shelly, do you want to come back on stage? Oh, oh one action you could do tomorrow. Shelly said I would give you solutions that you could do tomorrow. One thing you can do, endorse a woman. Do you remember when Shelley said that if you toot your own horn, people might not like you? An experiment was done where a professor said in one experiment, here's my TA, and just mentioned her name. In another condition, he tooted her horn for her and said how amazing she was, what publications she had, why they should listen to her. In the condition where the professor tooted the horn for her, her ratings went up. So even if women might have to navigate the likability penalty around tooting their own horn, you can toot their horn for her. So always introducing a woman, making sure you vouch for her competence is one way that you can work towards her being recognized as an expert and as a leader. Another thing you can do is just block the automatic use of language. Don't write a letter of recommendation without thinking, what am I trying to say about somebody? Um, you could also, I noticed this with my kids too, what I'm criticizing about them by gender and trying to make sure I do that equally for them. 
And lastly, you can update your resume or LinkedIn profile or have someone you know update their resume or LinkedIn profile to be reflective of their true accomplishments in ways that will help them attain everything that they want in leadership. So with that, we'll see if, if you have any questions. There's a couple of microphones in the room, yes. so oh, if you have right. a question, if you could go to the microphone. Um, otherwise, we have to repeat it and we may botch it, so. <laughs> yes. Thanks so much. This is uh, really helpful. And, and for me, I, I work at the World Bank in Washington, yeah. and we're actually going through an edge survey right now as part of the, uh, the gender strategy for the organization. And I, I hope that they make um, the comments public for at least the staff, I mean, because they ha did when it was both men and women commenting. And this is something that's gone out yeah. just to the women. So, um, But that's a lot great. of this resonates very much. My question is, I'm the mother of three teenage girls. And my middle daughter is, you know, I think has a lot of very uh, intrinsic leadership qualities, but those things can sometimes be, make it difficult. She's, you know, in the 10th grade. And um, I'm looking for, you know, different kinds of programs or ways to support her, I mean, in all three of them, but especially her that she's got that, um, we were in the power, I was in the power one earlier, you know, the little girl that was, <laughs> many, of, any of you were in that one, but they were talking about girls versus boys. She's got some of those characteristics that are, um, you know, sometimes off-putting, I think, to yeah. both girls and boys, and I want to help to, you know, give her the tools she needs as well as my other girls. I just wondered if you had anything for the kind of that next generation. Yeah, I, mean, I should say that that's a, it's a, a very, uh, it's a very common finding with, uh, with young, with young girls that are exhibiting um, leadership behavior to be called, you know, bossy, for example, which is a derogatory term, and I think serves to dampen their ambition, and I mean, it's something I think we just absolutely don't want to do. So the question is, what can we do then to um, provide a good space for them to develop those skills and recognize those skills? I mean, I think one, um, you know, as a, uh, you know, to Lori's point about endorsing the competence of other people to sort of to, sh to very clearly um, try to correct some of those things in, in amongst the, the people who might be critical of her. So I think it's you know important when a, a girl is exhibiting leadership skills and, and there's negative attention drawn to that for somebody to be able to say about her, you know, I think she actually could be running her class or something like that. She, Cheryl Sandberg loves to say, say she has executive presence instead of she's bossy. Um, but to reframe what it means um, to be a leader for a young girl I think is actually really important. And then uh, there's, there's all kinds of uh, are starting to emerge new kinds of workshops and things that you can send her to where she'll be around other people who uh, peers that are more like her which helps validate that so we've been we have a program we call seeds of change that is a middle school high school girls kind of a leadership program and not only does it teach skills but it puts them in contact with other girls who uh, value those same skills and that's very important is to have that peer group it's a great question. Yeah, we also have some free videos online under Voice and Influence. So there are professors like Maggie Neal from the Business School and Deb Grunfeld here as well. And I have a girl who's in seventh grade and I've watched them with her and talked about them. And one of the things we know about young girls is you can't always figure out what their peers will say and give them ideas about how you can frame opportunities for them. But another thing to think about is what's their why they're doing things. Being in touch with a leadership purpose or a vision purpose or something like that can help you figure out, oh, maybe it's worth having someone call me bossy because I'm going to go change the world. So sometimes our work of Seeds of Change, part of what's in there is find, helping young girls find the why and then going back to that why when they do f face some of that pushback externally. Okay, so we'll go here and then over here next. Go ahead. Okay. Um, as to the feedback loops and, and the degree to which women receive positive feedback relative to men. How much, has any work been done on, on looking at the, at the sexuality aspect? Positive input is the language of intimacy at some level. And some men feel far more uncomfortable with that or knowing how to rephrase or reframe what they want to say so that it doesn't take on context yeah. or that doesn't bother their own subconscious feelings. Right. Has there been any work on this? Yeah, you know, there's so there uh, there there is some work that shows that that is one of the barriers that some men will describe and say mentoring women, for example. I mean, you know, how is it going to look? I mean, you know, you know, hanging out with this woman in a bar. You know, how are people going to read that and worrying about those kind of things? Um, I think the. Um, 
the solution to that is similar to a lot of the other solutions that we've offered, and that is we need more clear criteria about how you do mentorship, how you, um, how you give feedback. So for example, on the work we're doing with language, um, we've been evaluating lots of performance evaluations, and you know, the, the, the language use is overly creative. I mean, people are writing things that are just crazy in some of these reviews. It's, it's just not good. So what we've been doing is working a little bit on teaching people what kind of things you say, because if you're a manager and you're told these are the kind of things you talk about and your subordinate knows these are the kind of things your manager is going to say, it's not going to be misread. It's going to be what the company is suggesting that people do. So we have to provide tools to help people also do some that. Also training in mentorship. Exactly. And, the, and, and what's appropriate behavior on the part of the mentor and what the mentor's own subconscious feelings are on, during that interview. Yes. There you Interface. Go. Yep. Thank you, sir. Yes, we're doing a video actually in our new Voice and Influence series on having effective mentoring relationships, and we talk about the roadblocks, which include protective hesitation on the part of the mentor to give hard feedback, and protective defensiveness on the part of the mentee to hear the hard feedback. So we'll be tackling that next year. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Question over here. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, I'm Suzanne Butler. I'm class of 1964. Fifty years ago, when I was an undergraduate at Stanford, there were almost no women on the faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, George Spindler was chairman of the anthropology department, and my one experience with a woman faculty member was his wife, uh, Lois Spindler, and she was a teaching assistant or something along those lines. The, Gender ratio at the undergraduate level, I think, was five men to three women. Mm -hmm. It might have been five to two. Mm -hmm. I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. But that was then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My question now is how much progress has Stanford made yeah. on hiring women at uh, full faculty and giving them tenure? Yeah. So, uh, so I, I chair the Provost uh, Committee on Faculty Equity, so I usually have these data handy. So um, uh, I should say at the student body level, we're doing great, okay? I mean, it's, you know, like most universities, really pretty close to 50-50. At the faculty level at this point in time, amongst our um, assistant professors, we're 27% female. Okay, so we're a little over a quarter. When it comes to full professors, we're more between 21 and 22%, um, so about one in five. So we're not where we want to be. We're not, that's not, that's kind of on par with our peers. So it's not like, you know, Stanford's having a unique problem here, but we're not, we're not where we want to be with that. And I think there's a real concerted effort, um, especially on trying to hire women in the STEM fields and in the business school where women are especially in low numbers um, and, and importantly trying to hire faculty of color as well. But we're, we're not where we want to be uh, at this point yet with that. Partly this is, you know, uh, uh, yeah, on the, there's, okay, on, so on tenure, when we talk about tenuring people from assistant to, um, you know, to associate professor, there is not a gender gap in who gets tenured. And this is, this I think the university has given a lot of thought to how it is that we are evaluating people for tenure. So it's not that gender never matters, but overall the pattern looks really pretty good there. So our question I think is really, a, our, our challenge is hiring people and getting them here. Um, and then I think, I think we're doing okay on the other dimension. I see we're almost out of time. Maybe we could do one more question and then I'm happy to uh, answer a few questions individually afterwards. But um, so I think she was here first, is that I'm sorry. Your comment on seeing the bias as the mother of a uh, tuba player, female tuba player, five years yes. ago when the woman was uh, hired for the Philadelphia Symphony and there was all the news articles on how a woman had finally landed the position. None of them mentioned that women had been winning the position for years on the blind auditions and that when they saw a woman was mm -hmm. chosen on the blind auditions, they redid them visible. Not one news article. So I wrote in about the statistics because I had them yeah. from a tuba player with a master's degree. Is there a place we should keep our eye to um, to check in with some of the statistics? Because my awareness is business is all the time. I'm with people who do not see, acknowledge that there is a bias. And I have to have constant statistics, language, to keep asking, having paraphrase, asking for more information. Can you give us something to keep our eye to? 
Yeah, so this, the, you know, the statistics are going to be spread out depending on the, what the category is. But I, but I want to just, um, I just want to underline what you're doing as being very important. Um, that is, you know, now I mean, it's pretty easy to Google and find statistics on things. When someone says to you, you know, there are no women here, there are no women in the pipeline, there are no women that are eligible for this, that we should not take that as an answer. Um, that's almost always not the case, right? So if I see, you know, major awards have just been given to people people and there's only one woman there out of you know all the 10 people that have been nominated I write and say where are the women and often I hear back well no one nominated them or da 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 there's all these excuses but there are women out there and I think we have to help um, point that out to people so I would just underscore that in those situations if you hear there are no women dig a little bit and find some for them because there, there are women there and we need to help promote women all of us if we're going to really advance women's leadership and I'll just end by saying again I mean this is not just about women this is about you know this is about real Really driving the best uh, innovation, scientific discovery, and solving the biggest problems in our world. We need to have all people involved. If the cure for cancer is in, you know, the head of some young African American woman, and we're not listening to her, we're all losing out on that. So we really, this is something that really affects us at a societal level. Thank you all very much. Yeah.